Hey guys, welcome back. Let's get so on episode four, topic today, printing stuff. But anyway, more importantly, do you guys ever use this utility called Cat? Basically, it lets you print stuff to the screen. Um, yeah, it works just fine. The problem is if you use it, you're officially a boomer because there's a better version that we just made a couple days ago, I made, called Nyan Cat, which is the same thing in every way, only it's like 30% less legible because everything is rainbow colors. So. If you want to see how that works, we'll talk about that in this video, as well as everything that goes into it. And the cool thing is, is that like the Linux version of Cat, it's like 140,000 bytes. This one is like 800 or less. And we didn't even code call it. That's just what it comes out to be. So if that interests you, check it out uh, at the end of the video. So let's go through the very short set of slides I have. And so first thing and pretty much the only thing that we're going to cover is this uh, right syscall and if you can't see this on the bottom right that's the 105 <laughs> but basically the way this works is uh, on Linux and BSD there's a right syscall where you pass it in a file descriptor that could be either screen like the console where you're going to pass in standard out or it could be an actual file um, that you've already opened so you can write bytes to that file this character array buffer in RSI, that is kind of the address for your memory is that you want to be printing. And, and then uh, the number of bytes in that array. So and also it prints out, it returns, I should say, the number of bytes that it wrote, uh, if you care about that. I don't really care about that value. Uh, so let's say you wanted to print out a nine byte string at address 1942. What you'd do is you'd pass in the file descriptor for the output in RDI, you'd pass in the num the address in RSI, you'd pass in the number of bytes in RDX, you'd, you'd pass in the syscall ID in RAX, execute the syscall. That's how the process works. Very simple, and that's what we're going to do in this video, but we're going to make a function to do it for us. Thanks, Plank. Um, but I want to speak about syscall a little bit more closely because I have to make an apology video. I didn't think I'd make this kind of video so soon, but we got to apologize. And I apologize that the FreeBSD devs are almost as dumb as I am. That's my apology. Uh, yeah. So basically, I never came across this because I always use System5 ABI, in which case this is not a problem. But when you assume that all registers are being preserved across every function call, like we are in this series with our own ABI, this matters. And so what the problem is, is that in Linux, when you call a syscall, it clobbers RCX and R11. Why that is, I mean, it makes sense. It has to preserve certain things. It has to use those registers for certain things. But on FreeBSD, they also clobber R8, R9, and R10 at least. As far as I can tell, that's what they clobber. In addition, it could be more. I have no idea. I have to check that. But either way, I put a listing in the syscall ASM for both FreeBSD and Linux that has an OS dependent macro basically called syspush syscall clobber registers and syspop registers. And so basically on FreeBSD, when you execute this macro, it will push RCX, R8, R9, R10, and 11 to the stack and then pop them off in reverse order. And on Linux, it will only, it will only push the you know, outer two, not this and not this. So yeah, I changed the code to reflect that. If I figure out that there's actually more registers that are gonna be clobbered in Linux or BSD, I will adjust these macros accordingly. And here's how that process works. For one of the um, programs that we're gonna actually be using today, and we used in the previous video, file open. Basically, you remember I, I had sets of pushes and pops above and below the main code body where I was just saving all the registers that were gonna be clobbered. In this case, I'm just executing that macro, syspush and syspop. So very simple. At this point, we're pretty much done with the slideshow. I'm gonna get right into the code. So I wanna first show you kind of the motivation for this. So I have four examples here. Let's start with example uh, B. That's what I was just talking about, so. Let me open up this stuff and so yeah all we're including here is exit and the syscall listing 
that will give us the, the variables like sys standard out and sys write that we need to execute this, this code. So what I've got here, ignore the commented out parts, that's for a, little, a later bit. Um, basically, we're doing what I just said. We're moving that file descriptor into RDI. We're moving the text address. Here's the, the text that we're going to be printing out. That address is going to be in RSI. Now here you'd put in RDX the number of bytes. If you're too lazy like I am to count this 22 bytes, what you can do is <laughs> you can just um, compute that with NASM. So what you can do is you can actually subtract um, text, that address, from address after text, and that would give you the number of bytes between the two. So you can use this to kind of count strings for you if you're too lazy to count them yourself. Um, and then we're moving the syswrite call into RDX, calling syscall. And if you execute this, it prints out the string to the screen. So we're done with our video. Thanks for watching. Just kidding. If we go back, uh, and I want to uncomment out those lines, I want to show you something. As you would expect, this is a loop. So we start out with R15 is a million. Every time we go around the loop, we decrement and we jump back to the top of the loop until we get to zero, in which case we exit. So let's just run that. And you can see it's printing out a bunch of random nonsense to the screen. It does it pretty quick, um, but that's not the, not the issue. On Linux, you have a command called strace. On BSD, it's called truss. You can actually um, count the number of syscalls being executed by a program um, with dash C. Oh, now it's even slower. You know, the time it takes is always different, you know. I don't know why. I think it's just because the console is a bunch of voodoo magic. Sometimes this is actually faster. Okay, anyway, you can see here that there's a million calls to the right syscall. I'm not sure why it's not telling us about the exit, <laughs> but oh well. A million calls to right, which is what we expect. We, we did that loop a million times. But here's the thing. If I go back into this other example, example A, and look at what's in here, this was the C version of the same thing. This is just printf a million times. So you would expect this to also be, be doing a million syscalls. Right, we're looping a million times, printing the same exact string. So if we if we run this, I should have trusted it. <laughs> why did I not do that? Oh, and I know why. You can see here, obviously the boomers got involved with a bunch of this crap as well, like IO control and F stat and memory map or whatever, who cares? But look at the right row. Only 5,372 calls to the right syscall. We had a million. How did they get away with only 5,000? Well, my friends, let's see. So we did, hold on, let me quit this out. Let me get the more sig figs here. So we did a million syscalls, and each of those strings was 22 bytes. And Somehow it managed to only do that in 5,372 write calls. Hmm, very curious. Does that number make any impressions on you? Does that mean anything to you? Five oh or sorry, four oh nine five point three. Yeah, is that is that not basically two to the twelve? I think what's going on is they're buffering it. I have no idea. I didn't look this up, but I'm guessing that they're buffering the output. In other words, they're filling up a buffer with their strings until it gets to 4K. And then when it hits 4K, it flushes the buffer. And let me show you how I think that's working in the last slide here. I could be wrong about this, but what we just did in our assembly code was we were writing one, not one letter at a time, but one string at a time. Right? We were writing that. 22 byte string out three times, or in, you know, 20, 26 times. And that was a lot of syscalls and that was slow. What I think they're doing in C is that they're basically putting those strings in a buffer and then they're auto flushing that buffer whenever it's full, but then at the end of their program, they're also flushing the buffer. And maybe on new lines, they're also you know flushing their buffer as well. Sorry, this says faster. So yeah, it's fewer syscalls, it executes more quickly. So why don't we do that? And we will. And we will. So 
Let me go to the third example, buffered writes. Let's take a look at the code and also let's take a look at the, um, the two, let's look at this one, hold on. Print cars, hold on, let's the second one as well. Live I print. I have two functions here. One is print characters and one is print string. Let's look, look at all three. Oh, also, let's look at the um, print buffer flush. I should have prepared this beforehand. Okay. And so in this code, it is very much the same thing, except we're not going to do the syscall in a loop. We're going to be using this print characters function instead, which we're including here. By the way, the align, this align thing basically means whenever, you, it basically will align that code to its number of bytes. So this will align at the 16 byte boundary, which is a little bit faster when you're calling functions many, 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 many times. That's why I have aligned this print characters function. So whenever we jump to that, it will go a little bit faster. And also you can see I have aligned the loop there's some pros and cons to doing that, but I aligned the loop itself. So every time we jump to the top of the loop, it also is a bit faster, just a pro tip there. Anyway, um, let's take a look at these other two functions that uh, we're using here. So there, I actually have three. There's print cars, print string, and then there's print buffer flush, which I'm not including, but it's being included by print cares. So that's fine. So in print cares, this is basically kind of a wrapper function to write things out to the to the buffer and then to the standard out. Actually, I think I'll first start in the print buffer flush. Actually, no, screw that. Let's start in the actual code. You can see I've not played this video out at all. I have at the top a third directive here, which is now print buffer size 4096, just like it was in C on this machine. And so what we're doing in our headers is before where we had these two quad words one was code size indicating the size of our binary on the hard drive and this was the size of the binary in memory once the program loads it up i've added this value so now let's say the code was 200 bytes long on the hard drive now when it loads up it will be 4296 bytes in memory and only these bytes will be in the first 200 and then or sorry, all these bytes will be in the first 200, and then down here where it says print buffer, at the end of the software, there'll be an extra 4,096 bytes that will all be zeros, hopefully, at runtime. So that's the idea. That's kind of the idea of, you know, using a print buffer. This is like having a dynamically allocated memory, sort of, because it's not going to, it's not a variable that we're defining a priori. So in the print buffer flush array, this kind of manages that, vector that 4k vector in memory and all it does is well obviously it does some pushing and popping to say registers but it pretty much just manages is manages that buffer and so it has its own variable a global variable mind you remember if it has a dot in front that would be a like a local variable or a local address this is actually a global uh variable that we can access and it just can it just can encodes the number of bytes that we've written to our buffer array. So let's say we had one of those strings from before was 22 bytes. Whenever we print it, it would increment this value here by 22. And once we break 4096, this writes. And so you can see this is the most fundamental of, of things. This literally just, this is like that writes this call from the beginning. This moves the address into RSI, moves the number of bytes, which is accessed at that global, you know, variable location. It moves the syswrite into RAX, executes this call, and then it resets the value in this location. So it's very straightforward how this works. I'm gonna close that because it's uh, boring. Now I've got two other functions here, uh, print cars and print string. Um, and all they do is what I just showed you before. I'm not gonna go through the code in detail. You can take a look at how it works. But basically, it is just uh, loading inputs from the input array into the buffer array. It's loading RDX of those inputs into the buffer array, and then it's checking if we have reached the maximum size of the array, and whenever we have, it flushes it. So this will automatically flush the array 
every time uh, the buffer is full. So it's very simple. Then it pops the registers back and leaves. And the last thing I wanted to show was this print string. Now this is the same exact command, except it, you can see it has two, well, sorry, one fewer arguments, only two arguments. Again, it takes the file descriptor and an address to memory, but this involves null terminated character arrays. I mentioned those in the previous video. This is whenever you have an array that you don't know the length of necessarily, but it ends with a null byte, it ends with a zero byte. So this way you can just write out a string that you don't know what it is beforehand. As long as it ends with a zero, you, you can tell how long it is. So this requires one less input. And all it does, you kind of can see, it just counts the number of bytes <laughs> you see here in RDX, and then it executes print cars itself. So it's just a, a wrapper for the previous function that counts the number of bytes in the string before it calls that function. So it does some work for you. I would never use this unless you didn't know a string beforehand. I don't like string formatting like prints, like printf and stuff, because you do, you're making the computer do work at runtime that you could have done beforehand. So there's no reason to do that. So in this case, you know, this is just for like strings that you don't know. Let's say it's user input. Let's say it's from a file, you know, or whatever. That's when I would use this particular uh, function. So that's that. Now let's look at the code that calls it. So this is the same code as the previous example. Again, we're moving singered out to RDI. We're moving the text address into RSI. We're moving the length of the string into RDX, and we're looping a million times. And uh, you can see we're in this loop. We're calling print characters. We're decrementing our counter variable R15 by one each time. When that hits zero, we fall out of the loop. Otherwise, we keep looping. And once that loop's done, I'm showing you the other example, in which case we're using that second function, that print string. And this is a null terminated text. So down here, you can see I have two pieces of text. I have the old sample text, as well as I have this one. This one is basically a new line character, the word done, another new line character, and then a zero byte. You could also do a slash zero to encode null byte in this as well. One tip I have for you is that when you're using these slash ends, um, make sure you use those like back ticks and not regular quotes. Sometimes they break. So if you don't use the back ticks, which is at the top left of, of my keyboard, you can handle uh, fancy inputs like slash n and slash zero and slash r or whatever um, more easily. Anyway, yeah, this line basically just moves that address into RSI and calls the null terminated print function that we just made. And lastly, the thing that we have to do that we didn't have to do in C is that whenever we end our program, we have to make sure we flush the buffer because we have no way otherwise to do that. Let's say the buffer is only half full. It will, it, when you're done with the program, that will not have flushed. So you'll be, you'll be losing 2,048 bytes worth of valuable information that you didn't print out. So whenever you end your program, you have to make sure to, print, to flush the print buffer before you leave. So this is what that's doing. It flushes the buffer automatically, or I should say, uh, like, uh, manually and uh, then it exits the program before you know okay so let's run that one you can see it's printing out a bunch of stuff and say it printed out done but more importantly than that let's actually look at the number of syscalls here you can see there's a uh, 5,372 syscalls, just like there was in C. So we've implemented this the same way that C did, same size buffer and everything. But actually, if you wanted to go in and you want to change this buffer, you can change this buffer. Let's say you want to make it uh, twice as big. That works, and let's truss it. You can see we have half, half this syscalls. So you can change that value very quickly and recom you know, recompile and re-execute your code. All right, with that out of the way, we'll get into our final example, which was the Nyan cat. This one's a little bit more complicated. It might take a while to go through. Maybe I'll just skip the hard parts. I think I will skip the hard parts. <laughs> In this case, there's another value here. So I'm using a print buffer size of 128 bytes and also a read buffer of 128. Again, you could change these numbers to whatever you want. I just kept them the same just for the you know example here. Now, this means we have more memory to define. We have another buffer to work with. Why are we doing this? Because 
remember the cat function that was taking bytes from a file and printing them to the screen. So we have to be able to take, we're gonna buffer our input as well as the output. And so if you look here, remember it used to be just code size plus print buffer size. In this case, we're adding another buffer, which is read buffer size. So we'll have the size of our code in RAM plus 128 bytes of zeros plus 128 bytes of zeros when this is loaded into memory. And at the very bottom of this, you can see I have the print buffer at the end of the program. And then you can say I have the read buffer, which is just offset from the print buffer by the size of the print buffer. So if you grow the print buffer, read buffer will shift down in memory when this thing is loaded. Not not in real time, but you know, before you, you have to compile that. But yeah, this basically will automatically locate itself in the right location per the size that you give for your read buffer. Okay, let's talk about how this works. So there's a lot of inputs into this program. And again, includes are literally just copy and pasted from other files. So we are copying and pasting the so syscall listing, depending if you're on Linux or BSD, you're putting different values in here. They're all like NASM, like macros and, and, and other syntactical things. Um, we have a function called file open. I think I covered that in the previous video as well as print cars. We also have print and C formatting. This is how you do uh, colors. Why don't I open that really quick as well? Um, yeah, that's important actually. So in this case, it's just a bunch of defines. So I'm defining these different things. I have ANC clear screen, ANC reset, ANC bold, all the different colors. <coughs> there are actually more colors. I just picked the cool ones. And um, basically all it does is based off your input, you input the file descriptor and the number of the ANC color or format that you want to put in. Let's say you want your code to be, you want your print to be cyan in color, bright cyan, you pass in 25, or you can just pass in the string ANC bright cyan into RSI, execute this code, it will print the proper escape code to color your um, text out. And if you care to look at how that works, at the very bottom, you kind of can see how the escape codes work, at least how I'm implementing them. You have this slash E bracket. This, these two bytes mean it's an escape code. Then you have either two bytes or three bytes worth of values for formatting or colors. And uh, this basically prints those out. If you're curious, you can check the code in the SoyHub repository. So back to the match here. That's a uh, print cars. That's the printing prunk function. Then there's print ANSI formatting that prints out the colors. Read cars. This is basically um, just a wrapper for the sysread command that reads values from an address in, uh, or sorry, from a file descriptor into a, a buffer. In this case, the read buffer. And then we have our our, our flush buffer. Uh, function and our exit function. So everything you should understand as far as includes go. Now the instructions. So we're using what we did in the previous video to get the command line argument. So remember we have to take in a file. Remember we're printing out a file to the screen. So we have to take out the file, you know, out of the command line argument. So in this case, we're checking from the previous video, the argc, it has to be two. If it's not, just leave the program, call it a day, you've had enough work. Uh, you, you can't figure out how to use the software, don't bother. If you did pass in two though, you won't jump to fail. And so now we're gonna access that second location in the argument that is the, the path to the file. And we're gonna open that with file open. The only thing that's important here is that we're opening the file, but we're saving that file descriptor in R8. Now R8 would normally be not a good place to save something because that's, a, that's not a callee save register that's, that will that would lose its value if you're running in System 5 ABI. But because we're using our own ABI, we can use any register we want because all registers are saved across function calls. At least they should be. Then I'm using the low three bits of RBX to refer to the color of the rainbow. So we're using seven rainbow colors here They're at the bottom of this file. I'm using the rainbows defined as this dot colors. That is ANSI red. And see yellow. Yellow is actually orange on my computer. Maybe it's more yellowy on your computer, but on mine it's orange. Then bright yellow is more like a yellow color. Then followed by green, cyan, blue, magenta, and then like pink. That's kind of the rainbow I'm going for here. 
and uh, basically we're using RBX to access the low three bits. So zero would be here, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And once you make it back around to eight, you are gonna get rid of those high values and go back to zero. That's kind of how I'm accessing the, the, uh, the rainbow here. Okay, so that's that. Now we have two loops. We have an outer loop, which just fills the buffer from reading the file. So basically we're gonna constantly keep pulling 128 bytes from that input file over and over and over and over again in this in this loop. So this just basically does that. It, it, uh, it moves that file descriptor value into RDI, um, moves that buffer location that we have at the bottom of our code into RSI, so it knows where to write the, write the bytes of memory to. Then it uh, reads the buffer, it puts the read buffer size, the 128 value into RDX, and it's gonna keep reading 128 bytes over and over and over again. And what we're doing is actually, in this case, we're saving that return value, which would be an RAX, into R15. And that basically, what we're saving is the number of bytes read. And that should be 128 every single time. Whenever you read, it should be 128 except for two times. That would be when you get to the end of the file and there's only like seven bytes left, it will return seven because it only read seven new bytes. It didn't read 128 bytes, it read the last seven bytes of the file before the file ended. And then when you get to the end of the file, it will return obviously zero. So the way this works is um, this loop is valid for a, a number of bytes read greater than zero. Once, once we get the zero bytes returned, jump to done, we're done reading bytes. We're done with the whole program. That's how the program terminates. Basically, we jump to done. And at the bottom, done basically is, you can see here, um, flush the print buffer and then return zero to the, to the console. Okay, that's the outer loop. Now, the inner loop is where all the work gets done. So at this point, remember, we have a, a full buffer. Ideally, that's 128 bytes of new things to print. And the first thing we do is we print the color. So we always start off with, I guess, red, for each new line, but you can see at the top here, we set RBX to zero, so that will refer to red. Um, so basically what this does is it um, puts the standard out into the RDI file descriptor, then it kind of computes the address of, actually it, it puts the, the ANSI color value into RSI, zero extended, that's what this means here. It means all the leading values, you know, the high values are zeros above the, the low byte. And we print out the formatting. So this will print out it will make everything, this makes everything after it red, but we're only gonna print one byte at a time, so we'll only make the next byte red. Then the loop will go, next byte will be orange, then the loop will go, next byte will be yellow, etc., etc. So after it makes the next color, it does the next character. So in this case, it's just taking um, the next byte from the read buffer and printing it out. And you can see here, we use R9 to track that location. So every time this loop starts, this inner loop, we set R9 to zero. And so that's the start of the read buffer. And so basically we're going to go to the, the first byte of that buffer and print it out, standard out, using the print cars function. So one byte at a time gets printed. At least it gets put in the, the print buffer, not printed to the screen, but put in the print buffer that we're gonna eventually flush when it fills automatically or manually at the end of the program. And so there's two things to keep track of. There is B, RBX, which is the kind of the offset we're using into the rainbow, as well as R9, which is the number of bytes that we are in our print, in our read buffer. And so I'll skip this part for a second here um, and show you this part. So every time we write out one letter, we're gonna increment RBX, in this case, just the low, the low byte of RBX by one. So it's gonna go from zero to one, one to two, et cetera that we're gonna throw away whatever is not in the low three bits by using and BL7, that only keeps the last three, right? Seven in hexes, or in binary is one, one, one. So this just keeps the last three bits. And then it increments R9 as well. So this will keep pushing us one byte forward in the rainbow and one byte forward in the read buffer. Okay. And then this, this last bit of co code here before I get to the you know fancy bits is that whenever we get to a new line, we reset to red. I want all the reds to line up, all the oranges to line up, all the yellows to line up as we go left to right. So this basically just checks um, if we have a new line character, the new line um, ASCII value is 10. So if that uh, color is 10, we just reset RBX to zero um, using this kind of logic here. 
Now down here, this basically checks if we're done with our buffer. So there's two bits of logic. It's a little bit confusing. The first one is to go through whether or not we've actually filled up the buffer in the first place. Um, let's say we, we're trying to get 128 bytes, but at the end of the at the end of the file, it's only like you know seven bytes left. You have to be able to check for that. I'm not going to go into the details of how this comparison works. You can take a look at the code, go line by line, and see. But this just checks if the if the buffer is full or if we're out of bytes to print. And if it is, jump to done, leave the program. Otherwise, jump to the top. The only last bit of cool stuff that I had to do here was these five lines here. Actually, I guess six lines, but one of them is just an address. Um, basically, I because of the way, I mean, let me actually open this again. Because of the way this works, where you're printing out like escape codes, sometimes these escape codes won't be aligned properly. Like what happens if you're 126 bytes in your print buffer, you're at the end of your print buffer, and then you have to print out the escape code. What's gonna happen is it's gonna put slash E bracket in that print buffer. This is two bytes, slash E is just one byte, bracket is one byte. It's gonna take that, put it in your print buffer, and then flush it. So now you're gonna have printed out 126 bytes of important information and then bracket E, you know, E bracket, right? Whatever that means. And then the next, that, that, that means nothing. And then it's gonna flush out 2J and then the rest of important values. So it's not gonna, it's not gonna count as an escape code because it's gonna be divided at the end of the buffer. And so what I had to do was, I had to put some logic in here to check if we were almost full and if we're almost full flush because I can't let it get full because it, we might accidentally have our escape code on that boundary, which would not would not actually work and it would look stupid. It would print out a bunch of crap to the screen and we'd be embarrassed. <laughs> so what this does is, this five lines here, this basically checks if we are within five bytes of filling up our print buffer. If not, don't flush yet, otherwise manually flush. So this is kind of, we're cheating, we're basically using a smaller buffer just to make sure that we don't accidentally cut off our escape codes on the end of our buffer boundary. So just to show that in, in working order here, um, let me compile that. And so now we have a binary. Let me just show you how big that binary is. It is only 765 bytes, so way less than it is on Linux. Linux, it was like um, 140,000 bytes, which is absurd. On on BSD, it was better. It was like only like 14,000, <clears> but still, I mean, this is way better. And we didn't even try to code golf it yet. You could make this way smaller if you wanted. We're, we're still using the full 64-bit registers and stuff. You could probably get away with smaller ones. You could inline everything. It would be way better. But anyway, you can show this works by running that binary that we just created on the code itself. And this will print out immediately to the screen if you want to, and that's fine, but uh, normally you want to be able to read what's in there and so you pipe it into less. The problem with less is that it, you can see it doesn't like escape codes. You can see all our random colors and stuff in here, like all this random junk. And so instead of that, what you can do is you can pipe it into less, but do dash R, that preserves color. So now you can kind of go through, read your code, like you normally would. The only bug with this, and you call it a bug, you call it a feature, is that you'll notice that everything lines up, you know, rainbow-wise in each column. The problem is, look at tabs. A tab only counts as one byte. So the oranges are like a tab minus one space off. You know, so cause I, cause I, I tab indent everything that's not an address. And so the oranges don't line up. Really, we didn't account for that. If you, you could go check for a you know a tab um, byte and then count it as whatever was it one two three four spaces if you want and do that logic on your own time. Be my guest. But yeah, otherwise you know you're gonna have kind of zigzaggy rainbows, which is fine. It's still impossible to read. It's still distracting. It's still objectively worse in every way than the you know, Unix utility cat, but uh, I like it. And that's why I've added it to our um, list of bins. So if I go to our bin directory, we have a couple files 
that we have here, a couple of you know tools we can use. We have Vic Executable, which we use all the time. We have Niancat, Recycle, and Spawn. These are all utilities that we've made in kind of our bare bones library list, linker list, assembly. And uh, yeah, they're, they're pretty pretty cool pieces of, of, of programming, in my opinion. That's it for the video. I hope you guys like this. Um, if you did, let me know in the in the comments. One last thing, I will plug the Fed Honeypot. I mean, sorry, the Discord server link in the description. It's only the true viewers because I'm only plugging it at the end of the video, not in the beginning. So only the true MLG viewers know about this. Anyway, thanks for watching. Have a nice day.